Good evening, and uh, welcome to Beit Avichai. The famed document that is the focus of this evening was accepted by the British government on the 2nd of November, 1917. We find ourselves in the depth of World War I, no one yet knowing how the war would turn out, who would win, who would lose, what would happen in the, in the world. The remarkable story of the Belfort Declaration, the foundation stone to modern Israel, like the state it helped to create, was also the most incredible of success stories. The prominent Jewish intellectual Arthur Kessler repeated a frequent mantra, called it one of the most improbable political documents of all time, in which one nation solemnly promised a second nation the country of a third. The document was written at a time of Anglo-Zionist intimacy in Great Britain. This evening, a joint event of Europeans for Israel, the Jewish Hist Hist Historical Society of England, Israel chapter, the Belfer 100 Committee, <laughs> the Zionist Council of Israel and Beit Avichai, celebrates the centennial of the Belfer Declaration. To discuss the, the significance of this document, as well as the lessons that's, uh, that can still be learned, we are pleased to present the award-winning journalist and political commentator, Melanie Phillips. As many of you here, I have read Melanie's thoughts for years, watched her powerfully present in televised and radio presentations and debates, and can readily say that even if you don't agree with her, Melanie Phillips, uh, Melanie Phillips is a person whose opinions should always be heard. As for the other organizations joining us this evening, the significance of our work here at Beit Avichai is found in the renewal of the Jewish people in Zion, and it is therefore important to better understand the significance of a document that helped lead to the establishment of the State of Israel. To introduce Melanie, I am pleased to present Herb K. Nunn, the Jerusalem's post-diplomatic correspondent and the author who has lived in Israel for the past 35 years. Herb, thank you. Thank you. Um, on November 12th, on November 2nd, 1917, as World War I raged on, and months after various drafts were submitted and considered, Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour wrote a letter to the Lord Walter Rothschild to be transmitted to the Zionist Federation of Great Britain and Ireland that electrified and transformed the Jewish world. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. And so it began. With a single sentence, with just 67 words, in tweeter parlance that would be 285 characters or just over two screen tweets, right? The Balfour Declaration became the seminal document that led eventually to the creation, the establishment of the State of Israel. And as we approach the, uh, the Declaration Centennial, it's fitting and timely to look back at the Declaration and try to understand the significance of it then and what relevance it has, if any, in understanding what's happening now today. And to do this, I'd like to introduce Melanie Phillips. Melanie, as we all know, is a British journalist, broadcaster, and author her weekly column, which currently appears in the Times of London, has been published over the years in The Guardian, Observer, Sunday Times, and Daily Mail. She also writes for the Jerusalem Post and Jewish Chronicle, is a regular panelist on BBC's radio's The Moral Maze, and speaks on public platforms throughout the English-speaking world. Her best-selling book, Londonstan, about the British establishment's capitulation to Islamist aggression, was published in 2006 by Encounter in New York, she followed this in 2010 with The World Turned Upside Down, The Global Battle Over God, Truth, and Power, also published by Encounter. An updated paperback edition of Guardian Angel, her personal and political memoir, is being published in the U.S. in January of 2018, and her first novel, The Legacy, is due to be published here there in the spring. Melanie will speak, and afterwards I'll come back and ask her a few questions on her presentation. Melanie Bavakasha. Thank you. 
<clears throat> thank you very much indeed, Herb. Uh, good evening, everybody. Erev Tov, and thank you so much for coming this evening to hear this presentation. Earlier this year, Britain's Prime Minister, Theresa May, told us that Britain will this year celebrate the centenary of the Balfour Declaration with pride. In November, the British government will mark it at a ceremony in London to which Prime Minister Netanyahu has been invited. It is, I think, fair to assume that not all British citizens will be overjoyed to see Mr. Netanyahu in London, nor will they be thrilled to be invited to celebrate the Balfour Declaration with him and Mrs. May. That's because relatively few people in Britain are supporters of Israel, even fewer support Mr. Netanyahu, and even fewer still know very much about the Balfour Declaration and the way the British subsequently interpreted the mandate for Palestine. In 2014, Boris Johnson, of whom you may have heard one or two things, wrote in his book, The Churchill Factor, that the Balfour Declaration was bizarre, a tragicomically incoherent document, and an exquisite piece of foreign office fajarama. Well, Boris Johnson has himself now become a piece of foreign office fajarama, as he is allegedly the Britain's foreign secretary. And indeed, in a subsequent visit to Israel, Boris suddenly discovered that the Balfour Declaration was, in fact, a great thing that reflected a great tide of history. Well, that's Boris for you. But that profound ambivalence towards the Jewish homeland is also Britain's historic story. On the very day that the British took Jerusalem from the Turks during the First World War, the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Balfour, was helping formulate the famous declaration that bore his name. This made the momentous statement that Britain would view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. This epical commitment arose from a unique combination of circumstances which came together in a tiny window that had opened in history, which was very soon to slam shut once again. The Balfour Declaration was produced by a British government dominated by evangelical Christian Zionists, Christians who believed in the redemption of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. Among the Jewish people, modern political Zionism was kick-started by the writings of the journalist Theodore Herzl. These two things, the Christian Zionism of the British government at the time and Theodore Herzl's monumental contribution, these two things are generally known. Less well known is that the genesis of political Zionism itself was itself intimately connected with evangelical Christianity. I owe this fascinating information to an absolutely invaluable book, The Politics of Christian Zionism by Paul Merkley. Herzl had had his epiphany about anti-Semitism through the Dreyfus Affair in France in 1895. He concluded that the only solution to anti-Semitism was Jewish national self-determination, as he set out in his book, Der Judenstaat. Now, this book was read with great excitement by a German-raised member of the Church of England, the Reverend William Hechler. He was chaplain to the British Embassy in Vienna. Hechler was himself an evangelical Christian Zionist who had been brought up under the influence of the conviction shared between then the Church of England and the United Evangelical Church of Prussia that the Jews should be restored to the land of Israel. These two churches shared a bishopric in Jerusalem. It was the only Protestant activity permitted by the Ottoman Empire, and that bishopric originated with a Prussian diplomat called Christian Bunsen. When Bunsen learned that the British government had acquired the unprecedented right to build a Protestant church and schools in Jerusalem, he immediately became convinced that God had given Britain responsibility for the restoration of the Jews to the land of Israel. And in 1840, he wrote to William Gladstone to tell him so. The following year, 1841, the Prussian king sent Bunsen to Britain to set up this project, this church 
uh, in Jerusalem. He did so with someone called the Earl of Shaftesbury. Now, Shaftesbury was the man at the very core of the great pioneering Victorian social reform movements of the 19th century. These movements were rooted in evangelical Christianity, which drew its compassion for the weak and the vulnerable straight from the Hebrew Bible. This veneration of the Hebrew Bible made, in turn, Shaftesbury and his fellow evangelicals zealots for the return of, as he, would put the t as, as he described the Jews, God's chosen people to the land of Israel. They believed the biblical account of how Zion had been promised to the Jews by God, and they further believed that the Jews' return would presage the second coming of Christ and the perfection of the world. Mr. Hechler uh, was not himself the kind of evangelical who wanted to convert the Jews to Christianity. He was the kind of evangelical who wanted the Christians to understand that their religious uh, requirement was to support the return of the Jews to Israel, and he also, Mr. Hechler, wanted the Jews themselves to understand their own religion. After reading Der Judenstadt, Hechler invited Herzl to visit him. In his house, he laid out before Herzl, on the floor, a map of Palestine, showing Herzl where, according to Hechler's calculations, the new temple should be located, and showing him models of the ancient temple, saying, we have prepared the ground for you. It was Hechler who, in a long story, opened for Herzl the diplomatic doors to the Germans, to the Turks, and to others, which would eventually lead to the First and Second World Zionist Congress in Basel, and also help make possible, alongside other individuals who were involved, Herzl's subsequent entree into British government circles. Well, unfortunately, the first expression of British sympathy for Jewish self-determination, because there was great sympathy for Jewish self-determination because there were so many Christian Zionists at the top of the British government and in British society generally at that time. But unfortunately, the first expression of governmental British sympathy for Jewish self-determination was when the government of which Arthur Balfour was actually then prime minister suggested in 1903 that the Jewish national home should be created in Uganda. At this point, Chaim Weizmann entered the story. Weizmann, uh, who had come to uh, live in Manchester and worked in the University of Manchester as a chemist, was to become of very considerable importance to the British government during the First World War through his development of acetone. But during the general election of 1905-1906, it was Arthur Balfour who happened to be Weizmann's local Conservative Party candidate in that general election. Weizmann, an absolutely passionate opponent of the Uganda proposal, and someone who was dismayed by Herzl's own apparent ignorance of the deeper context of Zionism within Judaism. Herzl did not emphasize the necessity to build the Jewish national home in Palestine. According to uh, Weizmann, this was a terrible omission. Weizmann was brought to meet Balfour to explain to Balfour why the Jews would return, should return only to Palestine, why the Jews had been so passionately opposed to being dumped in Uganda. As Weizmann recorded of this exchange that he had with candidate Balfour, quote, then suddenly I said, says Weizmann, Mr. Balfour, supposing I were to offer you Paris instead of London, would you take it? He sat up, looked at me and answered, but Dr. Weizmann, we have London. That is true, I said but we had Jerusalem when London was a marsh. Now, Balfour's attitude to the Jews was not without its own complications. He was brought up by an evangelical mother who would have instilled in him, undoubtedly, the ideas of the Jews as special, the idea that the Jews uh, should return to their ancient land uh, in Israel. But he nevertheless had some views that grated. For example, in 1905, 
uh, during the debate over the Aliens Bill, which was later to become the Aliens Act, uh, a bill which was drafted principally to keep out Jewish immigrants because Jewish immigrants at that time were perceived to be mainly Bolsheviks. During the, pass during the passage of the Aliens Bill, in which uh, Balfour was intimately involved and which he very much supported, he said the following. He said, quote, a state of things could easily be imagined in which it would not be to the advantage of the civilization of the country, meaning Britain, that there should be an immense body of persons who, however patriotic, able, and industrious, however much they threw themselves into the national life, still by their own action remained a people apart and not merely held a religion differing from the vast majority of their fellow countrymen, but only intermarried among themselves. Yes, Arthur Balfour, author of the eponymous declaration, was talking about the Jews as a race apart, British Jews in Britain, and that would be to the detriment of Britain. But Balfour was also full of remorse for the way in which Christianity had treated the Jews over the centuries. In 1917, he wrote to Harold Nicholson, quote, they have been exiled, scattered, and oppressed. If we can find them an asylum, a safe home in their native land, then the full flowering of their genius will burst forth and propagate. In July 1918, he wrote to his sister, quote, the Jews are too great a race not to count, and they ought to have a place where those who had strong racial idealism could develop on their lines as a nation and govern themselves. Close quote. And in all this movement of thinking to be much more sympathetic to Zionism as the restoration of the Jews to their ancient land in Israel, in all this he had been undoubtedly greatly influenced by Weizmann. As Balfour later acknowledged, he said, it was from that talk with Weizmann during that general election of 1905, 1906, it was from that talk with Weizmann that I saw that the Jewish form of patriotism was unique. Well, during the war, Weizmann met and persuaded to the Zionist cause a number of key people, including C.P. Scott, editor of the Manchester Guardian. Yes, when it was in that noble city of Manchester, the Guardian was on the right side of the Zionist argument. Uh, he influenced David Lloyd George and other government figures. As a result, by the end of 1914, a memorandum on the subject of a Jewish state under British auspices was beginning to circulate in cabinet. Now, the support of two people in particular in that cabinet was absolutely crucial. One was Lloyd George, whose intensely philo-Semitic Welsh nonconformist parents had instilled in him the necessity for the Jews to return to their ancient land, and the other was Arthur Balfour. When Weizmann and Balfour met again, Balfour said, you know, I was thinking of that conversation of yours, and I believe that when the guns stop firing, you may get your Jerusalem. In 1917, the Great War was ending with the defeat of the Turks and with Britain and France about to carve up the Middle East between them. Britain needed a strategic buffer in Palestine to keep the trade routes open to India. It thought, in addition, that the pledge of a Jewish national home in Palestine would rally support by Russian Jews, which would, in turn, encourage Russia to stay in the war. So there was a certain degree of realpolitik uh, in the decision to promote the idea of a Jewish national home in Palestine. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think it would have happened had there not been uh, such a, uh, a, um, a solid phalanx of uh, cabinet ministers who were evangelical Christian Zionists. After protracted negotiation between the Zionists and the British government, the Balfour Declaration was ready. It was produced by 10 men from the war cabinet, no fewer than seven of them from evangelical Christian Zionist backgrounds. Such a moment would never be repeated. It took the form, as you know, of a letter. The declaration took the form of a letter from Balfour to Lord Rothschild. You've heard the text already this evening, but I will say it again. 
His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing should be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. This was a milestone of enormous significance, and yet, and yet, it did not commit Britain to establishing a Jewish state as the Zionists had wanted. The terminology was a, the, the, uh, the establishment in Palestine, in Palestine, of a Jewish national home. I'll come back to the ambiguity of this language later in my talk, because it's significant. Well, within a month of this letter, the British forces in Palestine drove the Turks from Jerusalem. In 1919, after the war had ended, the Paris Peace Conference accepted the premise of the Balfour Declaration to grant the Jews a national home in Palestine. At the request of the Jews, Britain became the mandatory authority for Palestine responsible for implementing this policy. In April 1920, the League of Nations mandate for Palestine was ratified in San Remo. Under the terms of the mandate, the British had a duty to facilitate Jewish immigration and close settlement in Palestine, which then included what is now Israel, what is now called the West Bank, what is now Gaza, and what is now Jordan, although the boundary of the mandate was at that moment at that point in time, left undefined. In 1922, the mandate's final terms declared that, quote, recognition has been given to the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine and to the grounds for reconstituting their national home in that country. This was crucial wording, reconstituting their national home, the historical connection of the Jewish people with Palestine. These are words that you don't hear today, and we should. Today, there is a widespread belief that the British promised Palestine uh, in a kind of double cross. It promised Palestine to the Jews, and it promised Palestine to the Arabs, and that is said to be one of the reasons why this thing has never been resolved. Well, that's not so. The British did not make a double promise. In 1915, the Arabs had been promised British recognition and support for their independence in the Turkish districts of Damascus, Hama, Homs and Aleppo, but not Palestine and not Jerusalem. For their part, at that time, the Arabs themselves almost unanimously approved of the Jews' return to Palestine. They called it Palestine, the Jews' fatherland, and spoke of the benefits to themselves they expected from Jewish settlement. King Faisal of Iraq wrote a letter congratulating the Zionists and the then Mufti of Jerusalem, the leader of the city's Muslims, even helped lay the foundation stone for the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Just fancy that. The Balfour Declaration was an epochal event, but as David Ben-Gurion was to caution, quote, Britain has not given Palestine back to us. Britain has made a magnificent gesture. She has recognized our existence as a nation and has acknowledged our right to the country. But only the Hebrew people can transform this right into tangible fact. Only they, with body and soul, with their strength and capital, must build their national home and bring about their national redemption. Well, that was to prove far, far harder than even he could ever have thought. The reason was this. Although the British government, as I've said, contained so many Christian Zionists committed to the restoration of the Jews to their own ancient historic land of Israel, the British military administration in Palestine and its uh, people in the colonial office were horrified by the government's declared policy of resettling the Jews in Palestine. Not only were many of these officers fundamentally prejudiced against Jews per se, but in the hysteria of the time created by the Russian Revolution of 1917, in which Jews were thought to be disproportionately involved as Bolsheviks, these officers, along with officials in the colonial office in Whitehall, believed that the Zionists were just Bolsheviks conspiring to subvert the empire. Almost before the ink of the mandate had dried, the British started to make life as difficult as possible for the Palestinian Jews under their authority. 
First of all, they dramatically shrank Palestine itself. They lopped off some of the most fertile areas and gave them to newly created Syria, prompting a protest by the American president, Woodrow Wilson. In September 1922, the new colonial secretary, Winston Churchill, then gave away some three quarters of Palestine to the Hashemite dynasty to create another new country, Transjordan, later Jordan. Now, Churchill was later very well known for his passionate support for the Jews of Palestine, but at times his attitude was nevertheless somewhat more ambiguous. He hived off uh, three quarters of Palestine to the Hashemites, reportedly to buy off Arab opposition to the Jewish homeland, which he thought would then be left to arise undisturbed west of the Jordan, because Churchill was passionately committed to the restoration of a Jewish homeland. Well, whatever the reason for what he did, it was a fact that Britain thus unilaterally shrank by some three quarters, the land which the League of Nations had decided should be the Jewish national home. Not only that, since Britain agreed that not one Jew would live in Transjordan, Britain helped create the world's first ethnically cleansed Jew-free territory. That was, however, as nothing compared with what was to follow. From evidence provided by contemporary observers such as the American writer William Ziff and the political officer charged with overseeing the mandate, Colonel Richard Meinertzhagen, the British in Palestine not only did everything they could to prevent the creation of a Jewish national home, but became accessories to the rise of Islamic extremism and the mass murder of Jews. Before the mandate was even signed, the British suppressed all mention of the Balfour Declaration and even censored references to the Jewish Legion, which had fought gallantly for Britain in the Great War. They proceeded to flood the Jerusalem Corporation with Arab appointees, declared they would address Jewish delegations in Arabic, and announced with relish that, quote, Jew baiting had been the sport of kings for centuries and centuries. They consciously fomented hostility between Arabs and Jews to make it impossible to create the Jewish national home which Britain had pledged to establish. Deciding that the Arabs were more malleable than the upstart Jews, they also set about talking up a mythical pan-Arab claim to Palestine, which they knew perfectly well did not exist. In 1918, General Louis Bowles was appointed military governor of Palestine. Another military official of the time observed that Bowles was, quote, an out-and-out anti-Semite who would leave no stone unturned to destroy the Jewish national home root and branch, close quote. His chief of staff, Colonel Waters Taylor, told a well-known Arab agitator named Hajj, Azim, Hajj Amin al-Husseini that if sufficient violent disturbances took place over that Easter, the idea of the Jewish national home would be abandoned. Hajj Amin duly instigated a riot. The British administration reacted to the riot by withdrawing all Jewish police officers from duty and disarming the Jews while surrounding the old city of Jerusalem to prevent any outside assistance for them. The government is with us, cried the rioters as they massacred Jewish victims. The following year, 43 Jews were murdered in another riot in Jaffa. The pattern was to be repeated countless times in the succeeding years. Arabs slaughtering Jews, British officials and police ignoring warnings and desperate pleas from the Jews for help and disarming them instead. A subsequent committee of inquiry which exonerated the Arab attackers and blamed their Jewish victims. The 1918 atrocity made waves. A committee of inquiry was set up. It blamed the disturbances on Jewish provocation. But Colonel Meinhertzhagen reported that the British military had been complicit in the attacks. As a result of this row, a civil administration replacing the military one was appointed under an individual called Sir Herbert Samuel. For the beleaguered Jews of Palestine, however, this was merely a leap from the frying pan into the fire. Although Samuel was himself a British Jew, he was the kind of British Jew who falls over backwards to appease his tormentors. I'm sure none of you knows any British Jew like that. Samuel was surrounded by anti-Jewish officials, one of whom said after the inaugural reception for staff, quote, 
And there I was at Government House, and there was a Union Jack flying as large as life, and a bloody Jew sitting underneath it. It was the craven Samuel who appointed Hajamin, the instigator of the 1918 atrocities, as Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. Despite the fact that Hajamin had been sentenced to 15 years hard labor for his role in those events, and although he had most mysteriously managed to escape from prison, wonder how, Samuel pardoned this murderous thug for his crimes and appointed him Grand Mufti even over the protest of local Muslims. In 1921, another pogrom took place against the Jews. Despite patently mounting hysteria amongst Muslims celebrating the Nebi Musa festival, the British commander of police responded to this mounting hysteria by conveniently absenting himself while the few Jews in the police force were strangely removed from duty. A shout that the mosques were being attacked by Bolsheviks Jews started an orgy of murder and rioting in Jaffa with women raped, property pillaged, children butchered that spread to other areas and left 95 killed and 290 wounded. The subsequent Haycraft Commission of Inquiry found the Jews guilty of provoking this pogrom against them and within 48 hours Samuel suspended Jewish immigration into Palestine. The worst pogrom took place in Hebron in 1929. Incendiary rumors had been flying that the Jews are planning to tear down the Mosque of Omar on the Temple Mount. The Jews of Hebron had repeatedly asked for help but were merely told to stay at home. Violence was reportedly precipitated by the British police themselves who attacked a procession of Jewish mourners carrying the coffin of a young man who had been stabbed to death by Arabs. An eight-day orgy of murder and unspeakable savagery then took place, not just in Hebron, but up and down the country, while the British police and officials did nothing to stop it. Once again, the cry went up, the government is with us, kill the Jews. The Arabs indulge in a frenzy of murder, torture, rape, and dismemberment against men, women, and children. The British officer in charge in Hebron stood and watched the butchery. Eventually, a policeman stopped the violence with but one shot in the air. When it was all over, 139 Jews were dead and 339 injured across the country. Half the dead were in Hebron. At the behest of the Arabs, the then acting High Commissioner publicly paraded and disarmed Jews who had been defending themselves and then charged some of them, rather than the attacking Arabs, with murder. After the worst massacre in the Holy Land since the Crusades, the most severe sentence handed down by the British to any Arab involved in this slaughter was 18 months in jail. And in Hebron itself, one of Judaism's most sacred cities, and where a large Jewish population had lived continuously since Babylonian times, the British further responded to the massacre by ethnically cleansing the town of Jews. Protests erupted around the world at Britain's connivance in this slaughter of the Jews in Palestine. But in due course, the officials involved in handling the pogroms were promoted, and yet another official inquiry exonerated the Arabs and blamed the Jews. All of this caused Colonel Meinherzhagen publicly to protest Britain's handling of the mandate. Never had there been any instance, he observed, of Zionist progress at the expense of Arab rights, but incitement of the Arabs lay at the root of evil in Palestine. Well, along with facilitating pogroms against Jews on the ground, the British set about also tearing up their obligation to establish a Jewish national home in Palestine. In 1930, yet another commission into the continuing slaughter of the Jews, this one headed by Sir John Hope Simpson and replete with anti-Jewish smears, proposed restrictions on Jewish development, such as a stop to irrigation work and confinement of Jews to the cities, so that, quote, the Arab position is not prejudiced by Jewish immigration. Quick reminder, the British were under a binding mandatory obligation to settle the Jews in the land of Palestine. In the same year, the new colonial secretary in Britain, Lord Passfield, the former Sidney Webb, a noted intellectual, issued a white paper which proposed a complete stop to Jewish immigration in direct contradiction of the mandate. Protests accordingly erupted from governments around the world. In Britain itself, Lloyd George bitterly observed that, quote, 
they dared not kill Zionism, but put it in a refrigerator. Forced onto the back foot, the then Prime Minister, Ramsay MacDonald, told Chaim Weizmann that Britain would not abandon the Jews. His assurance was to prove worthless. In 1934, one year after Hitler came to power in Germany, the then colonial secretary, Cunliffe Lister, assured the Quakers, quote, I will not permit Palestine to be filled with Jews, close quote. As the Nazi persecution of Jews got underway in Europe, the British proceeded to unleash a Jew hunt in Palestine. As attempted Jewish immigration from Europe rose, desperate Jewish refugees said to have entered Palestine illegally were hunted down, arrested, thrown into jail, or deported. Meanwhile, large-scale and, un and unarguably illegal Arab immigration from neighboring countries was being totally ignored. As anti-Jewish riots continued, the British authorities did nothing to stop the incitement to violence being promulgated month after month, with the Arab press branding the Jews, quote, the human sexual disease and a menace to all mankind. As the Nazis stepped up their persecution of the Jews in Europe, Arab stormtroopers marched in Palestine, openly shouting Heil Hitler. Most of the ringleaders of these riots were on the British government payroll. In 1936, after the British had again ignored Jewish pleas to prevent what was coming, a bloodbath took place in which some 700 Jews up and down the country were mutilated and slaughtered in more than 1,990 attacks under the noses of the Palestine police, whose activities were confined as usual to forcibly disarming the Jews. In 1937, the Peel Commission, which was set up ostensibly to investigate the causes of the disturbances, recommended partition of Palestine into two states, one Arab, the other Jewish, with mass transfers of population between them. Sound familiar? This was the original two-state solution. The crucial point was that it was founded on an absolute betrayal of Britain's international treaty obligation, and just as with today's same proposed solution, constituted in effect a reward to the Arabs for their murderous aggression. In the 1930s, Britain was anxious to appease the Arabs because it was worried about the alliance they'd made with Hitler. But instead of fighting this Middle Eastern Nazi front, the British decided to reward it by proposing to hand it part of the very land the United Kingdom was committed to turn into a Jewish home and refuge. Despite an international furore over the Peel proposals, in 1939, the British government published a white paper restricting Jewish immigration to a total of 75,000 over five years, with any increase subject to the agreement of the Arabs. It also proposed turning Palestine into an independent state with a two-thirds Arab majority. The pledge to build a homeland for the Jews had been transformed into a commitment to create another state for the Arabs instead. There was an outcry. Churchill declared the government had violated the Balfour Declaration and abandoned its international undertaking. Leo Amory MP told the House of Commons that the government watchword was now, quote, appease the Arabs by breaking faith with the Jews, close quote, and that the white paper was, quote, a direct invitation to the Arabs to make trouble, close quote. The League of Nations Mandates Commission denounced the policy as a flagrant breach of the mandate, but the commission had no teeth. Amory's words proved all too prescient. Scenting victory, the Nazi-backed Arabs of Palestine instituted a revolt against the British, who as a result began to lose control. And as the Holocaust started in earnest, the British responded to Arab aggression by closing the gates of Palestine to the victims of genocide. At the Evian Conference convened by the, by the United States in 1938, every one of the 32 countries that participated, with the exception of the Dominican Republic, had refused to ease their immigration restrictions to accept more than a trickle of Jewish refugees from Europe. After the Kristallnacht pogrom in Germany, Britain, however, relented sufficiently to admit 10,000 Jewish children into Britain of the Kindertransport but in 1939, it blocked the Jews' escape route to Palestine, pressuring other European countries not to allow them transit on the grounds that this was illegal immigration. This was to stand truth on its head, since the mandate explicitly required the British to facilitate the settlement of the Jews in Palestine. In flagrant denial of this obligation, the British excluded Jewish refugees from Palestine because it was trying instead to gerrymander a two-thirds Arab majority. 
the Prime Minister, then Neville Chamberlain, said, quote, if we must offend one side, let us offend the Jews, not the Arabs. The desperate Jews tried to enter Palestine by boat, air, and land. The British blocked them, causing ships packed with frantic refugees to be blown up or sunk, interning some in harsh detention camps and sending others back to the slaughter in Europe. At the end of the war, no fewer than 36,000 immigration certificates for Palestine remained unused, deliberately withheld by the British. If they'd been granted, thousands would have been saved. In 1940, Britain stood alone against Hitler, but it did so in its own interests. In Palestine, shockingly, it stood against the victims of the Nazi genocide. That year, Sir John Shuckborough of the Colonial Office wrote of the Jews of Palestine, quote, this is in 1940, he wrote, quote, I am convinced that in their hearts they hate us and have always hated us. They hate all Gentiles. They cannot even keep their hands off illegal immigration, which they must realize is a very serious embarrassment to us at a time when we are fighting for our very existence. Close quote. The terrible and unacknowledged truth is that in Palestine, Britain, the creator of the Balfour Declaration, was an accessory to the Nazi genocide. Even after the Holocaust, Britain still denied the remnant of European Jewry entry to Palestine. The Labour Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevin made his prejudices plain when he criticized the supposed Jewish tendency, quote, to get too much at the head of the queue of the victims of Nazism in demanding help. Four months previously, the outraged American President Harry Truman had demanded the admission to Palestine of 100,000 Holocaust survivors. But Bevin, who in private had categorically rejected the idea of a Jewish state and believed that the Jews had organized a worldwide conspiracy against Britain and against him personally, stated that this would be, quote, to fly in the face of the Arabs. With Zionism now said to be a liability for Britain, and with the Arabs becoming radicalized by the fanatical zealots of the Muslim Brotherhood and arming for further violence, Bevin decided to dump the whole Palestine problem onto the United Nations. When the UN decided on partition, the British lobbied against the creation of a Jewish state at all. In 1947, hours after the UN voted to partition Palestine into a Jewish and an Arab state with the British abstaining, the Arabs launched their war to exterminate the Jewish state at birth. Still, the British stood by while the Arabs attacked the Jews and refused to allow the Jews to arm themselves. Worse still, the British were implicated in a series of atrocities, including the bombing of the Palestine Post, the lynching of four unarmed Jewish resistance fighters, and refusing to come to the rescue of the victims of a hospital-bound convoy who were attacked and burned alive, with 77 doctors, nurses, and scientists killed. The historian Howard Sachar refers to Britain's undisguised partiality for the Arab military effort, with the British making no effort to hide the fact they were arming the Arabs. It had been in the aftermath of the 1929 riots that the Irgun paramilitary group was formed to provide a more effective defense for the Jews of Palestine. Along with Alechi and other similar groups, it would go on to fight both the Arabs and the British with dozens of raids on British military targets, including the infamous attack on British military headquarters in the King David Hotel. Members of both of these groups, however, were hunted down and punished by the more moderate Jewish defense force, the Haganah. No such condign action was ever taken by the British against those in their own ranks who connived at the attacks on Jews. For within three decades, Britain had been transformed from the country that was charged with recreating the Jewish homeland into the country that would go to war with the Jews to thwart the creation of that homeland. As Churchill observed, with the Attlee government's desire to dismantle the British Empire but make a last stand in Palestine, quote, Churchill said, to abandon India with all the dire consequences that would follow therefrom, but to have a war with the Jews in order to give Palestine to the Arabs amid the execration of the world appears to carry incongruity of thought and policy to levels which have rarely been attained in human history. In conclusion, I would suggest there are three main lessons to be learned from this most troubling history. The first is the need for a deeper understanding of past events, which will help us bring peace and justice to this region. The British undermining of its own Balfour Declaration set a pattern of Arab appeasement which continues to this day. It's a story of the utmost perfidy, betrayal of solemn treaty obligations, bigoted malice, and short-sighted pursuit of national interest, 
all of which not only laid the foundations for the Middle East conflict, but also turned Britain into an accessory to the greatest crime of the 20th century. This is Britain's dirty little secret, the most pernicious deeds committed in plain sight, but which nobody will acknowledge. It is this failure, I would suggest, to admit and then draw a line under the past, which explains why the Middle East conflict appears to be endless, even though the Western world attempts uniquely, endlessly, and obsessively to enforce a solution upon it. This is because the approach pioneered by Britain in the first half of the last century, which first fanned the flames of aggression and was taken up in turn by Europe and America, continues to this day. And this betrayal of truth, law, and justice also lies at the root of the West's current cultural confusion, which has made itself so vulnerable to attack. This concerted demonization of Israel represents the stunning success of a strategy of warfare which rests upon manipulating the West into punishing the victims of aggression while rewarding their attackers. This remarkable situation is not a marginal byproduct of the Middle East conflict, nor did the Arab and Muslim world dream it up from nowhere. It has its roots deep in Western attitudes, which date from the very start of the conflict in the aftermath of the First World War. This is why this conflict continues without a solution. In order to solve a problem, one must first correctly identify what the problem is. The Middle East conflict has two crucial characteristics, neither of which is generally acknowledged by the world. First, it is falsely represented as a dispute over the division of land between two peoples with rival claims to that land. In fact, it is a century-old attempt by the Arab world to extinguish the just and lawful existence of the Jewish national home in the land. Second, this is the only conflict in the world where, for the entirety of this century-old war of extermination, civilized nations have consistently rewarded and incentivized the aggressors and punished their victims or hung them out to dry, all the while purporting to be on their side. For what Britain, the US, and Europe have done in the Middle East since 1918 and continue to do has been to respond to Arab terror by first siding with it, then proposing to reward it with land promised under treaty obligation for Jewish settlement, and then punishing Israel for objecting to this threat to its own security. It is this failure to admit this behavior, and worse, its continuation, which explains the endless nature of the Middle East conflict. Western involvement is itself the key to the impasse, for rewarding aggression and punishing its victims inevitably encourages and incentivizes the aggressor, and that's what the West has done for more than a century. The Balfour Declaration was a solemn pledge made by Britain, which was then enshrined in a binding treaty obligation. In tearing up that obligation, Britain did not just betray the Jewish people. It also showed its contempt for international law. Rehearsing the details of this perfidy, as I've done this evening, is not about bashing the British. It is instead all about helping bring about an end to this interminable conflict. History tends to be dismissed as irrelevant to today's concerns. Israel itself shows absolutely no inclination to excavate the travesty of British policy in Palestine. I doubt very much whether you're going to hear Mr. Netanyahu tell Mrs. May some of the facts of history. This is a mistake. Israel's identity is defined by Jewish history. No solution to the Arab war against Israel can be reached unless the world faces up to what the Balfour Pledge represented and the lasting significance of its betrayal. The second lesson we have to learn from this story is for the British Jewish community. There are, of course, passionate Zionists among them today, as there were in the first half of the last century. But in the main, the endemic terror among British Jews of being accused of dual loyalty or treachery to Britain has for the past century prevented them from promoting the cause of the Jewish homeland as strongly as they should have done and should now be doing in the light of the unspeakable betrayal of that cause. When the idea of a Jewish national home in Palestine was first circulated in the Lloyd George cabinet, the only forceful opposition came from the one Jew in that cabinet, Edwin Montagu, Secretary of State for India. For him, the prospect of a national home for the Jews in Palestine raised the dread specter of dual loyalty. Quote, I view with horror the aspiration for a national entity, he wrote in 1916. Did I accept it as a patriotic Englishman, I should resign my position on the cabinet and declare myself neutral. In September 1917, he insisted that a pro-Zionist statement would alarm the Muslims of India and embarrass the Jews of England. Writes Howard Sachar, quote, the vehemence of his opposition to Zionism as a mischievous political creed led the cabinet to park the matter. 
When it resumed looking at the matter, Montague's opposition was even more intense. Weitzman wrote later, I understand the man almost wept. As a result of Montague's opposition, the text of the Balfour Declaration was modified. The phrase, the crucial phrase, that Palestine be reconstituted as the national home of the Jews was dropped in favor of the more vague and equivocal statement that we know and which has led to so much constructive ambiguity. My personal hope, Balfour told a friend in 1918, is that the Jews will make good in Palestine and eventually found a Jewish state. Balfour understood the point that the Jewish state had not been uh, guaranteed. It was a Jewish homeland. He knew why, but he wanted to make clear that what he wanted to happen was a Jewish state. But that was more than the Jewish leadership in Britain wanted. Weizmann regarded the attitude of the community leader, Lucien Wolf, with contempt and despair. Zionism was, in his view, wrote Weizmann, a purely East European movement with a certain following in the East End of London and beneath the notice of respectable British Jews. It was still harder, in fact, impossible for him to understand that English non-Jews did not look upon his anti-Zionism as the hallmark of a superior loyalty. It was never borne in on him that men like Balfour, Churchill, Lloyd George were deeply religious and believed in the Bible that to them the return of the Jewish people to Palestine was a reality, so that we Zionists represented to them a great tradition for which they had enormous respect. Well, I think that's a lesson that too many British Jews still need to learn today. Being anti-Zionist does not endear you to the non-Jews. The final lesson I would suggest is for the Christian churches. The Balfour Declaration was the political zenith of the evangelical Christian Zionism, which had become dominant in Victorian Britain as a reaction to the religious skepticism of the preceding 18th century. Yet, now we look back, we can see that it was at that high watermark, the Balfour Declaration, that high watermark of Christian evangelicalism, that not just Christian Zionism, but Christianity itself started to decline in Britain. The evangelical approach from that moment, for, from the end of the First World War really, shrank gradually to a minority view within the church within England, the church which progressively devalued the Hebrew scriptures for a much vaguer understanding of the divine. And now, surprise, surprise, the Church of England is deeply hostile to Israel. And as a further amazing coincidence, it is also struggling to fill its pews. The Church of England is dying on its feet, and for a closely related reason, that it has lost its essential connection with the Jewish precepts of the Hebrew Bible, without which Christianity is nothing. And without Christianity, Britain, as we know it, is nothing or at least will become something very different indeed. And that perhaps is the deepest lesson of all of the Balfour Declaration, that it was the high watermark, not just of evangelical Christianity, but also of British decency towards the Jews, and that what has drained away ever since then is not just that particular decency, but the soul of Britain itself. Yeah, this is on. Yep. Uh, Melanie, uh, what you chronicled isn't exactly an uplifting tale. Um, I'd say it's rather disturbing. Uh, Mike, is it on? You hear me? Okay. Uh, I said that it wasn't the very uh, uplifting tale that we've just heard. It doesn't make you actually want to go vacation in London. Uh, what you have is a, a magic moment in, in November 1917. 
and then essentially British perfidy towards the Jews from then on. What lessons should the government of Israel today take from the history that you've, uh, you've discussed here, and how should it inform the government's decisions going forward? Well, there are many lessons to learn uh, from uh, this history. Um, uh, members of the Israeli government, uh, particularly the Prime Minister, needs no lesson in this British perfidy. Other members of his government may be less uh, tutored in this, and I would suggest, I would think that many Israelis, if not most Israelis, don't know the details of all of this. I would suggest that many um, diaspora Jews don't know the detail of, of all of this. Um, there are many lessons that can be learned, but I think there are two in particular uh, which are related. Uh, one is to understand that history is not some dead thing in the past, which is of no consequence. One of the uh, attitudes that I find among um, Israeli officials and politicians and that kind of person is an impatience with anything that's not like today's problem. And it's understandable because, you know, today's problems are severe and have to be dealt with. And there's a kind of impatience with the past. The past is the past. And, you know, we all know, it's a sort of view, we all know that, you know, Britain is full of Jew haters and always has been and always will be, so why bother with them? Why bother with it? We have to get on now with what's facing us now, which is, as I say, understandable. But what I think that devalues and dismisses, recklessly dismisses, is that the world then becomes not just in a state of ignorance about the true nature of this conflict, um, but is liable to believe the propaganda of lies that is energetically coming at them 24-7. And consequently, uh, one, I think, has to go back into history to, to, to this history to explain just why the international community uh, said uh, that, Britain, that, that Britain should settle the Jews throughout Palestine, that the Jews should be regarded as being in Palestine, not on sufferance, but as of right. Because in Britain, and I can really only talk about Britain, this country that I know best, um, many people who are perfectly decent people uh, believe, because they've never heard anything other, that um, the Jews were interlopers uh, into Palestine, that the Jews were uh, uh, plucked uh, from the carnage of Europe uh, by, uh, a Europe by a Europe that was suffused with Holocaust guilt, uh, and these European Jews with absolutely no connection to Palestine were then planted in Palestine where they displaced the indigenous people of the land, Palestinian Muslims who'd been there since time immemorial. People of decent, decent people believe that. They've never been told the opposite. They've never been told the truth. Now, you know, the international community in 1920, 1922 said, you know, the Jews are returning as of right. It's their right because it was their homeland. And only, the, only the Jews were, it was, it, was the, it was only ever the Jews for whom the land of Israel was ever their national, their national homeland. That in itself would almost overnight transform the atmosphere in Britain. At the very least, it would mean that people would say, what did they say? Where did that come from? Is that true? It can't be true. Is it true? And at least, at the very least, you have a discussion. Um, so, and there, are, you know, that would be only be the start of the process. So, I think that you know, the first lesson is go back to history to restate truths which are being overlooked today. Look, and it's interesting because Prime Minister Netanyahu is very aware, acutely aware of history. And uh, he speaks a lot about history. He does. And he's, uh, he's articulate, right? He doesn't have an accent. He speaks well. And he makes these points. Uh, but the world ain't accepting them. So, so the question is, what else can you do? I mean, if you can, you can put down the facts. I mean, you said, I think, rather sanguinely, that if you just say, well, what happened in 1922, the British, uh, the British community will say, hey, we've got to think about that. Do you really believe that? Uh, just by presenting the facts, people are actually going to say, hey, there's a point there? I do, and um, you say, why doesn't you know, Mr. Netanyahu says all this? Well, he says a lot of stuff, which is very good, um, which other people don't say, but he doesn't say quite this. Um, and I think the reason why he doesn't say it is two reasons. First of all, Israel doesn't want to uh, upset its allies, and it believes that Britain is an ally. Well, you know, the other saying, with friends like these, who needs, who needs enemies? But, uh, it's true, Britain is an ally in many respects. It has very close military ties, it has very close intelligence ties, it has very close trade ties. The only problem is at the political level, um, which is a very significant problem, actually. Um, but so, uh, 
uh, the, the Israeli government does not want to pick a fight with its friends. Well, it's understandable, but the result of that is that by failing to tell essential truths, it's allowing uh, the demonization of Israel to proceed apace. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's um, uh, one main reason. Another reason which uh, officials have said to me over the years when I've said, why don't you start telling people some of the basic truths about the situation. Um, for example, a basic truth is that Israel is entitled to be here and it has always behaved in accordance with international law. Um, and uh, people don't know that. People don't understand because no one's ever told them what the law says, what treaty obligations say about this and that, to which the Israelis say, why should we, alone in the world, be required to justify our existence? Well, okay, I get that. It's very unfair, <laughs> but nevertheless, if you don't do that, given that many people in the world and many people in Britain believe that your existence is illegitimate, then it's absolutely your duty to tell them why it isn't illegitimate and why, if they do support international law, and justice and all that kind of stuff, they should be supporting Israel. The Israeli government doesn't say that. The Israeli government doesn't say there's a problem here in the world with law. We're on the right side, guys. It doesn't say that. But, but when, you, when you get into these conversations on the BBC and you start going digging back in history, I mean, don't you hear people say, well, let's not go back to 1917 or 1914 or 1905. Let's talk about how we can solve this now. Uh, there's, there's a certain tendency to want to block that out and move forward, no? Uh, you make an assumption that I can have conversations like this on the BBC. <laughs> uh. Um, uh, but insofar as I have ever been able to take up the advantage of the once in a lifetime opportunity to get in, I'm cut off on the basis that this is relevant. Right. It's irrelevant. Right. Um, and it's all too complicated anyway. I mean, you can't sort of say it in you know, a, a sort of 15 second soundbite. Mm -hmm. Um, it's uh, quite, quite demanding, um, but basically there you, you get no opportunity to say it. So, you know, there is a systematic um, uh, 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 suppression of this information. Uh, platforms do not exist to enable someone like myself to say these things. Um, the press itself will not report these things, will not initiate them, partly because they haven't got the faintest idea that these things are to be said, and partly because of ideology, they don't want to. So the way, the only way through that is for is for people to 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 be um, saying these things who themselves can't be ignored. In other words, they make a stink because they are who they are. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it requires some creativity. It's not easy, but it requires above all a strategy. And Israel doesn't understand what the word strategy is outside the battlefield. It has no strategy for combating this. It doesn't understand that it has a necessity for any strategy. And that's the problem. As you pointed out, I mean, Netanyahu is going to go to, to Britain on November 2nd and take part in the ceremony. Um, if you were to write his speech, <laughs> uh, what, what, what would you say? Well, I would just read out this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, would be, uh, I would be tactful while putting in the stiletto. Um, I would give the British people the credibility that they deserve for being the people who, beyond any other people, stand for law and justice and fairness. And that they did a great thing with the Balfour Declaration. And here's why it was a great thing. Because it, uh, at that point, the British government, God bless it, understood that the Jews alone were entitled to the land. And God bless it also, the international community endorsed that, and this is what the international community said. And I would read out the chunks that say the Jews alone are entitled to this land. That's what I would do. I would use the opportunity tactfully to introduce the facts of history. So on the balance then, I mean, uh, on the balance, uh, the, the Jews owe a debt of gratitude towards Britain despite it all. So are you saying this? Uh, are you I'm, asking me? I'm or? asking you, yes. Uh, yes, the Jew, oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, Lord Balfour did his thing. Uh, he issued his declaration. It did kickstart everything. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, it wasn't just Lord Balfour, it was, you know, all the members of the cabinet who thought in the same way. 
so one can't gainsay that. One shouldn't gainsay that. It was Britain's finest hour uh, insofar as the Jewish people were concerned. Um, it had never done anything as wonderful before, and it had nev it never did, it did anything as wonderful ever since. But it was wonderful. So we should say that. You, you mentioned that you mentioned that uh, that Israel. One of the reasons Israel doesn't go into this, perhaps, is because it sees Israel, uh, it sees Britain as an ally. Uh, is it an ally today, under under May? And and what impact will Brexit have on on, on our relations? Uh, it's a very complicated. It's a very difficult question to ask to answer, and I've often asked it of people who are very sympathetic to Israel, of whom there are approximately three and a half in Britain in public life. And they all say, oh, that's a really <laughs> difficult question to answer. I can't answer it. Because, as I said before, it operates on different levels. Britain is an ally. Britain understands absolutely that without Israel being Israel, uh, Britain would itself be in far greater danger from all the forces that we know Israel is, you know, in the, is the forward salient against all these forces. That's number one. Number two, it depends on Israel more and more for all kinds of stuff uh, to do with war and intelligence. Um, and the, as I understand it, uh, the uh, uh, alliance or connections between, on, on the military and intelligence level, are exceptionally strong, exceptionally strong. And trade, I mean, it trades, it trades. The, the problem is the political, on the political level. And Israel kind of overlooks that because, you know, it says, look, you know, BDS is going on, but I mean, who cares? I mean, you know, trade's going up with the European Union, so who cares? I mean, it's, one understands that point of view, except it's wrong, uh, because, you know, there's a lot that they could be doing and should be doing Israel. So should one regard Britain as an ally? Um, yes, I think one should regard it in a way like, um, I don't know, the analogy is perhaps not quite right, but... Um, uh, um, uh, an uncle that has taken to drink and crime. <laughs> <laughs> and you love your uncle, and he's still your uncle, and he's family, and you know, you'll go into the jungle for your uncle, and you'll do what you can for him, but ultimately, he's into drugs and crime, and that's not good, and you've got to basically get him out of that. It's that kind of relationship. Is it an ally? I mean, it's more of an ally than mainland Europe is an ally. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, is it as much of an ally as America, where it depends which president happens to be you know, in the Oval Office at any one particular time? And that's another story. How about Brexit? I mean, how is Brexit going to impact the relationship? Brexit and the Jews, hmm. Um, well, uh, I don't think Israel's government looks very kindly on Brexit. I think everyone's very frightened by Brexit because everyone likes Britain, you know, where it can sort of be neatly corralled as part of, you know, a block which is called the European Union. Um, and I think that like many diaspora Jews, I think, I don't know quite what the proportion of Israeli politicians think this, but certainly some of them think that um, uh, only the European Union stands between Europe and neo-Nazism. And that uh, you know, Britain leaving might precipitate the breakup of the European Union and that will lead to fascism in Europe. Well, hello, ever looked at what's going on in Europe at the moment? Um, so this is like absurd. And again, Israel can't sort of look up from its own navel to see the wider picture in my view, which is that um, if you suppress people's legitimate and natural desire to express their own culture through their own democratically elected parliament which passes its own laws um, and a, a, a parliament and a government which can be thrown out by the people. If you prevent people from doing that, from expressing their culture through a democracy, and if you furthermore rubbish and vilify uh, the desire to be a nation, a self-governing Western democratic nation, if you vilify that as racism, um, then you do get racism, then you get people turning against minorities, you get frustration, and you get what we're seeing at the moment, which is the, the, the people and the rulers in Europe becoming more and more further apart, and it's a very dangerous and unsettled situation. Um, so, uh, would Brexit be 
good for Israel. Actually, I think it would be terrific for Israel for this reason alone, that one of the reasons why Israel is so vilified by the progressive, so-called progressive forces in Britain and the West is that Israel commits three, thought, three terrible crimes. First of all, it's a nation. Secondly, it's a Western nation. Thirdly, it's an ethnic Western nation. So it's triply damned. Um, now, Britain's leaving the European Union is similarly damned by the same forces as releasing and be, as, as being motivated by racism, um, ethno-primitivism, nativism, and all that sort of stuff. It's basically, you know, you leave the European Union, you're a Nazi. If you want to leave the European Union, you're a Nazi. Right. Um, I think if Britain, if, see I'm slightly pessimistic, when Britain leaves the European Union and becomes itself a nation, then it becomes much more difficult to vilify Israel for wanting to be a nation, expressing its own culture through its own laws. Much more difficult. And so from that, per, from that point of view alone, I think that it would actually be a good thing. You mentioned the case of the rabidly anti-Zionist Jew, Edwin Montague. That, too, is a recurring phenomenon, that Jews were some of the Zionism's worst enemies, right? I mean, how do you explain that phenomenon uh, throughout the decades? Uh, and I'm not talking here about the, about the theological anti-Zionism of the Haredim, but I'm talking about the, the anti-passionately, rabidly anti-Zionist Jew who, up until this day, causes a lot of, uh, uh, causes a lot of problems for the country. Well, I don't think there's one single um, explanation. I think there are different types of anti-Zionist uh, Jew. Um, uh, in Britain, um, uh, it's a matter of simple uh, um, professional and social self-preservation to be an anti-Zionist Jew. Um, you take your life in your hands, uh, professionally and socially, uh, to be a Zionist Jew. Really? Yes, yes. So, you know, Montague and his ilk were entirely correct. Once you stick up for the, uh, once you stick up for Jewish peoplehood in their own country, then you've had it. You're a, you are a traitor to Britain. I've had that said to my face on television in 2002, uh, in front of a baying mob of a television audience who hissed and spat and booed and sneered and laughed. Um, as I was called, having, as I was accused of having dual loyalty. It was the first time I'd heard it um, overtly. But it's there all the time. As soon as you stick up for Israel, you become you, not we. The pronoun changes. Um, so it's all correct. Um, and so that's one, one, one reason. Secondly, um, uh, like many diaspora Jews, British Jews are comfortable. Um, and it takes a lot to disturb that comfort. If you're the kind of British Jew who lives in a Jewish area, you have almost universally Jewish friends, your children go to a Jewish school. You may work in central London, you go on the tube, um, you can still wear your kippah on the tube, no one knocks it off. Um, in central London, you're pretty safe. Uh, you work among colleagues who are, they don't say very much about is Israel or the Middle East. You don't say very much about Israel or the Middle East because it's not part of your life. You don't actually think about it that much. Uh, you may have occasional family there. You may occasionally go there for a holiday, but you don't really think about it very much. So when you wake up in the morning, you don't think, I can't bear to turn on the radio because I know what I'm going to hear. You don't think, I can't bear bear to open my newspaper because I know what I'm going to read. And it's going to be a lie and a libel and a defamation of Israel and I can't bear it. You don't think that because either, you don't, you're, either you, you're, you're not interested so you kind of tune it out or you kind of agree with it. You kind of say, yeah, you know, if only Bibi Netanyahu were basically to be removed from the human race, everything would be fine in the world. You might be that kind of Jew. Uh, or you might be the kind of Jew that says, you know, if only all the settlers were basically to go and jump in the sea, everything would be fine. There would be peace, be a two-state solution. You could be that kind of Jew. And there are many of that kind of Jew in Britain. So you have a very nice life. If you're the kind of Jew who gets upset by it all, who thinks that 
they're living in a climate of poisonous lies from morning till night, which is affecting good and decent people to think evil things to the detriment of, at the very least, and possibly the th a threat to the Jewish people, then you think very differently. But so you can be, it's perfectly possible to be a Jew in Britain and not see a problem. I mean, f forgive me for my ignorance of uh, the British Jewish community. I'm more familiar with the American Jewish community. The American Jewish community, at least at least in the East Coast, is very vocal, very out there, very open, very 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 strong uh, and effective politically. Uh, um, in, in Britain, it seems like the Jews are, are much more passive. Uh, why is that? Is that because is there sociological reasons for that, or? There well, again, this is a quite a complicated. Uh, um, uh, situation that you're alluding to, because the idea that there was, there was and is no anti-Semitism in, in America is simply false. There has been, over, over the decades, a lot of anti-Semitism in America. The idea that America is a melting pot and there was never any anti-Semitism is simply untrue. Um, but um, America, uh, first of all, is socially very different from Britain. Um, it doesn't have a settled culture which uh, was, is, is, was infused by anti-Semitism. Um, if you're educated in Britain, you're exposed to it. Mm -hmm. um, medieval history, literature, Chaucer, Shakespeare, T.S. Eliot, you know, you imbibe it. Um, and that's the culture that we as Jews, when we all arrived uh, at the turn of the last century, were supposed to be acculturated into. Um, so it becomes very difficult. and that wasn't really the case uh, in America to the same, uh, to the same degree. Um, so that's, that's one thing. The other thing is the church, the churches. It's absolutely crucial. Um, Britain is the wrong kind of Christian country. <laughs> um, Britain is a Christian country where the Christians burned the Jews alive in the Middle Ages and then threw them out. And it had two periods of philo-Semitism. One was under Cromwell, um, who brought them back, partly for economic reasons, but mainly because Church, uh, Cromwell was an evangelical, what we would call an evangelical. He was a Puritan, and it was, of course, the Puritans who founded America. They left uh, Britain because they disapproved so much of the theological underpinnings of the Church of England. And so America was founded on the understanding that the Hebrew Bible was the source of civilization. And so America to me is a Jewish country. I, and that's not to gainsay the fact that there are rednecks, there are people who hate Jews, there are people who've beaten up Jews over the, over the decades, but it's fundamentally a Jewish country in a way that Britain is not. And it remains the case that, you know, the, the red states, uh, with you know, all these people that we're all supposed to hate so much, the rednecks, uh, they all like Jews. Uh, they're evangelical Christians, and you know the Jewish communities in in the on the coasts. You know they have you know you have to sort of pass them the smelling salts if you mention evangelical Christians to them. They say but these people are anti-Semites. They want to convert us uh, when Jesus returns to Earth. To which I say, well, I'll take my chances when that happens, <laughs> frankly. But for the moment, they are the best friends that the Jewish people have in the world, bar none, including you. And strangely, they don't invite me back. Interesting. I mean, interesting what you say about the evangelicals, and that, that kind of segues into what you said during your talk. I'm curious as to the reasons for the decline of, of Christian Zionism in Britain, the decline of, of, of evangelicalism in, in Britain, at a time when you're seeing a, an increase in it, you know, in America. I mean, it, it, the American evangelical Christian Zionism over the last 40 years has, has just blossomed. Right, uh, so we go, we're going in different uh, directions. Why is that? Well, first, the first thing to say is that unfortunately there has been, and I, forgive me, I do not understand the theology of this, so I'm a little hazy about all this, but there's been a, a, a terrible split within the evangelical movement, both in Britain, tiny as it is, and in America, in that the evangelicals, um, as, we, as we've discussed, um, are Christian Zionists, they believe that the Jews are entitled to the land, that's where they were, that's where they should be, blah, blah, blah. Um, but now, within the evangelical movement, there has sprung up a vicious, vicious, virulent anti-Zionist section. 
And I can't tell you, I just don't know how big that is. I can just say it's growing. It's on the fringe, but it's growing. That's alarming. Um, but the, uh, the overall question of why evangelicalism died out, um, basically, it's, again, I, 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 to be honest, I don't know the answer. But I would suggest that it's not that evangelicalism died out. It was that belief in God died out. That after the First World War, the slaughter of the First World War um, almost finished off the church. I mean, the church had been reeling. Um, in, the, in the Victorian period, in the 19th century, the church was delivered this tremendous blow from Darwin. Um, and the Victorians understood that without the religious underpinning of society, society would basically go smash. And so they had to fend off what they feared, which was um, that there was no God, that life was meaningless, and that human beings descended from apes. And consequently, they erected religiosity. They kind of came to worship religion. And they did a tremendous job. I mean, Victorian England was, you know, fantastically church-going society bound by a Christian morality and all the rest of it. But it was hollow. It was hollow. It was all done to protect themselves or protect the religion from being smashed by the march of secularism. First World War happened. That was it. And then Auschwitz also. Uh, just because there was nothing there. They, there wasn't a solid basis. And now, so the question is why there wasn't a solid basis. And so one answer that was given to me by one of the Church of England's more turbulent priests is this, that the, the, the question is when the winds of secularism blew, why did the churches in America stay okay, broadly, broadly? And why did the Church of England blow over? And why did the Vatican take, lo why did Catholicism take longer to be eroded? Because it did in Europe, it's, a be it's being eroded, but it took much longer. Why was the Church of England so fragile? And the answer was, that this man gave to me, this priest of the Church of England, that the Church of England is basically a contract. Going back to uh, the wars of religion um, uh, uh, under Henry VIII, Queen Elizabeth I, um, basically, they all decided that the wars of religion just had to stop. P people were being slaughtered. Christians were slaughtering Christians. It was terrible. So, and this is a kind of very long theological story short, they created the Church of England as we know it today, which was basically doctrinally free. That is to say, they didn't touch the doctrine. The doctrine remained Catholic insofar as the people remained Catholic. Henry VIII broke broke from Rome, but he didn't break theologically. He broke from Rome because he wanted to divorce his wife and then several other wives. That's why he broke with Rome. He had no problem with the theology. So the people were kind of left stranded. They were basically still Catholic, but they had a king who had taken them away from Rome. So we had the wars of religion in Britain. And the, 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 the solution, which was a work of genius, was to void the church of doctrine, not to go there. So they erected the edifice of religion as an aesthetic experience. The Book of Common Prayer was written. The Book of Common Prayer is a work of poetic majesty. It inspires people. And they erected, they built wonderful cathedrals, wonderful, which inspire. And that's how they did it. And that's what people loved. The Book of Common Prayer, those wonderful liturgy, the wonderful hymns, the wonderful singing, the wonderful architecture. But w so there was nothing there. So when the real threat came, it blew over. Uh, that was his explanation. Interesting. Well, then let me just uh, I'll wrap it up here with two, two final questions. Um, and the first is that the Palestinians have actually threatened to sue the British for reparations as a result of the Balfour Declaration. And there was a campaign that garnered thousands of signatures in Britain asking the government there for an apology. While the Foreign Office said that it does not intend to apologize, it added in a statement, it, it put out a statement, and it said that the document, the, the Balfour Declaration, should, quote, have called for the protection of political rights of the non-Jewish communities in Palestine, yeah. particularly their right to self-determination. Good old Foreign Office. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, how do you respond to that? 
uh, it hasn't changed in 100 years, the Foreign Office, mm -hmm. from that point of view. Uh, it still hates the Jews. Um, the fact is, the Balfour Declaration, uh, which has been malevolently misunderstood, not least by the Foreign Office, uh, was very clear in what it left out. <laughs> um, it committed Britain to guarantee the uh, uh, religious and civic or civil rights. Right. It deliberately left out political rights. Right. And that's been carried out to the letter. Um, Non-Jews in Israel enjoy equal civil, civic, civil, um, and religious rights. Um, they also enjoy uh, political rights, equal political rights insofar as everybody has the vote. Mm -hmm. um, but it remained, it, 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 it was phrased in that way so that Israel would be a Jewish country, a Jewish homeland, that was deliberate. And for the Foreign Office to say that it should have been rights for everybody, is the Foreign Office saying there should be no Israel? Because that's what that would mean. No Jewish, no Jewish homeland, no Jewish country, no Jewish state. The Jews are not entitled to their own country. That's what the Foreign Office, in its previous <coughs> manifestation, thought then, and it's what it thinks now. At least some of them do. Um, I'm prepared to believe that, you know, uh, times have moved on. There are people who don't think that. But that's the kind of corporate view. That's the corporate view of the Foreign Office still. Mm -hmm. And it's lasted for a century. That's a long uh, corporate history. Um, the, the final question is uh, the Palestinians, like I said, the Palestinians are using the centennial to ask for an apology from the British. But what should we be asking for? What should we be asking for? We the Jews? Yes. Uh, to end the war of extermination, please. And we should be asking the world to stop it, to stop the war of extermination, to understand that this is a war of extermination and to stop incentivizing, funding, condoning, sanitizing, and therefore supporting it. That's what we should be asking. Thank you, thank you, Melanie, for the enlightening speech and the, uh, the, the lively discussion. Uh, this is the first event of many events that will be happening around the world, actually, over the next, uh, next couple of months to, to mark the centennial of the Balfour Declaration. Uh, I want to thank Melanie for coming here. I want to thank you for coming here. And uh, please attend some more of the events, because uh, these types of things you learn, as we see tonight, you learn quite a bit. Thank you. Thank you.